Hello and welcome to worship here at First Christian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. It is a joy to welcome you to this time of hearing Holy Scripture and the proclamation of the Word. Today I'm joined by our music director, Mark Miller, and by our videographer, Kelly Carroll. But we also are joined by Elder Wayne Duncan, who will be bringing us our scripture reading for today. We have a few things going on here at First Christian. Just a reminder that next week you will be receiving your messenger with up-to-date articles about all the things happening at the church and that you can also continue to follow things here at the church on our website at fcclincoln.org. And do like us on Facebook. We have a number of items that come up on our Facebook and our Instagram pages as well. Starting the week of the 24th, on Thursday the 27th, we'll begin a new practice where the church office will not be open on Thursdays. That will just take us up through the fall. But you can always leave a voice message or call Pastor Karen on your cell phone. But the other days, Monday through Wednesday and Friday, will be covered as usual from 8.30 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon. So just a few changes just to keep us on our toes. Also, a reminder, and well, for many perhaps the first uh, indication, that we have a very special event coming up on Sunday, August 30th, at 4 in the afternoon. We are going to have a Zoom conference that is sponsored by our First Christian Church Foundation and will be uh, conducted by Kirby Gould, who is with the Disciples Foundation, and she will be doing a presentation for us about estate and finance planning. Presentation will be about an hour, and we will have packets available ahead of time that if you're able to join us for in-person worship on Sunday, you'll be able to pick those up or contact the church office and we'll be sure that we make arrangements to get that packet to you before the presentation because it will include the presentation and some materials she will make allusion to while doing her presentation. So I hope you'll join us. I think it will be an enlightening time and let's face it most of us have some spare time right now as we kind of still continue to uh, quarantine in place and so perhaps you're like me you're trying to get some things in order this will be a great way to help you organize your financial uh, documents and ponder our stewardship of God's gifts to us so I hope you'll join us for that on the 30th now I invite you to Open your hearts to God in worship as we hear God's word of prayer. Our New Testament reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Wayne. This short and powerful passage out of the Gospel of Matthew is critical and it's one that is so very important that it shows up in all three of the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This identification of who Jesus is and who the disciples are is a critical component 
in the life of Jesus, but also in the life of the disciples and for us today. Jill Duffield, a Presbyterian minister and editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, reminds us that how we, who we say Jesus is shapes how we see ourselves and others. This passage is critical not just because it tells us something about Jesus, but perhaps more importantly because it tells us something about ourselves. We are told, as I say in all three Gospels, that Jesus comes together with his chosen, with his disciples, and he begins with a more general question, probably catching them not so much off guard yet, and he says, who do people say that I am? In a great kind of rabbinic tradition of a, a come and go, a question and answer, he throws the question out and the disciples respond immediately by saying, well, all kinds of things. People say you're you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Uh, other people say, well, you're a prophet, you're, you're like Jeremiah. And then he brings it home and he invites the disciples to dig just a little deeper and he asks them, but who do you say that I am? You can almost imagine them kind of sitting around looking at each other like, ooh, I wonder who's going to ask that question first. Maybe scratching their heads a little, wondering how on earth we're supposed to reply to this pointed question. And you gotta love him because there is Peter again, once again, he just jumps right in the fray and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now at first blush, one might think, well, I guess Peter, you know, had a special knowledge, some special insight. You know, maybe he was a little bit more learned or educated than the others. And then you're like, well, no, wait a minute. I think he was a fisherman. No, no, I, I'm not sure. But Jesus answers the quandary for the disciples and for all of us by saying that what Peter has shared was not from his own heart or his own mind. What he shared was given to him by Jesus, Father, by God. Peter is inspired to respond and names the true identity of Jesus as Messiah and Son of the living God. Jesus then goes on to talk to Peter and to, even though the question has not been verbally asked, Jesus goes on to answer the question for Peter. Peter might have said, well, Jesus, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? But without even having to be asked, Jesus replies and answers that Peter is the rock. He tells Peter about his identity, who he is. He tells Peter about his ministry, what his calling is. And he tells Peter about his future and the future of his church. In this short passage, we hear not only who Jesus is, but we have an invitation to consider, just as Peter did, who we are. In our recent pastor's retreat, we were invited as retreatants to consider that question as well, to think about if we could ask Jesus, who do you, Jesus, say that I am? Now I have to admit, I, I balked a little bit because I'm just not sure I'm into the artsy craftsy kinds of things. But once I kind of let the borders kind of go down for myself and kind of embrace the experience, found it a very moving experience to ponder, if I were to ask Jesus, who do you say that I am, what would be the reply? So we were invited in that retreat to create what they called a traveling book. It's really just a small booklet that they prepared for us ahead of time. They gave us, I call them, you know, uh, memes. I, I, I don't know if you can call them that when they're like in print and they're not on the internet. But anyway, we were given a whole series of different quotes, scripture, and other quotes, and invited to ponder that question. Who does Jesus say that we are? So for me, as I created my traveling book, and I mentioned this in my last Pastor's Corner, I chose for the preeminent piece on my front page, the passage from Jeremiah in which God 
describes the reality that God has plans for us, not for our harm, but for our good. And then underneath that, I placed a quote, I am enough. And as the time unfolded, I realized that the quotes that, that unfolded, the next one inside the front cover was one about me as a preacher. And then other scriptures evolved and came to my mind as I pondered our time together. And we pondered that question of who does Jesus say that I am? Now the reality for us as people of faith is that that question, that answer to that question, probably, hopefully, evolves and changes as we grow, as we grow as individuals, as we mature, but also as we grow as people of faith. But we do find that Jesus calls us by name, as he did Peter, that Jesus lays on our heart a calling, tells us what our ministry is, as part of the Reformed tradition, it's critical that we remember we are all ministers. We are all called to service. And Jesus tells us, perhaps most importantly, that we have a future. I would also venture to say that this passage is critical because it reminds us that we are called by name as individuals, that we are given a calling and a ministry, that we are given a future. But also Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock, and upon that rock I will build my church. It's critical that we remember that this interchange with Jesus is intended for us not only as individuals, but for us as a congregation, for us as people of faith. In these challenging times of COVID-19, we may find ourselves with a little more time to ponder such questions, a little more time to spend in prayer, perhaps to spend in journaling and reflection. I invite all of us to consider, if we were to ask Jesus, who do you say that I am, what would be that answer today? How would Jesus address each and every one of us by name? What ministry and calling would, does Jesus lay on our hearts? What future does Jesus prepare for us? But I invite us too in that pondering to consider, what would Jesus say to first Christian Church of Lincoln, Nebraska. How do we as a congregation answer that question? Who are we? Having just set, celebrated our 150th anniversary, as we grow and mature, it's critical that we answer that question. Who are we as a congregation? But perhaps even more important, it is essential that we address the issue of what are we called to do? What is our ministry? What is our purpose? here in the shadow of the Capitol. And then we are invited to consider what is our future. We know it is in God's hands and that God shapes it for us, but what is the future before us that God is shaping in our midst? Maybe you'll be creative and create your own traveling book. However you do that, I invite you to join me in pondering those questions because it is critical how we understand who Jesus is shapes how we see ourselves and others. Amen. And now as we ponder who Jesus is, I invite us to open our hearts to God in prayer. Please join me. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks that you invite us into your presence. That you ask us who you are, who people
people see you to be and who we know you to be in our lives and in our world. Oh God, this is a troubling time, a time of, of change and yet a static time in which we find ourselves in a new world. Oh God, there are many anxieties and fears that weigh on our hearts and we lift all of them to you. Oh God, we do proclaim with Peter that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and we entrust our lives, our hearts, our world to you. We know, O oh God, that you are Lord over all, and in these uncertain times, we rely on that certainty. But we know, O oh God, that there are also many who struggle these days, and we lift them to you in prayer. We pray especially for those affected by COVID-19 and for all those now who have died. We pray for those who love them, for those who grieve their loss. And we pray for all who tend to the sick, thinking of doctors and nurses, technicians, chaplains, and all those first responders. Oh God, we pray too for those for whom this is a time of struggle that is totally unrelated to this virus for those who have died and for their loved ones. And we pray for those who have perhaps more time than usual, time for remembrance, time when grief wells up, time for uncertainty, time for prayer. We pray, O oh God, that you would open our hearts, that you would lay on our hearts your identity as you do that on Peter's that you would empower us to share our awareness of who you are, not only in our words, but in our lives. We lift all these prayers to you and all those that we lift in the silence of our own hearts, knowing you hear our prayer and supplication. And now we join our voices together with the faithful throughout the centuries as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We're grateful that you joined us for this time of worship, and as I said earlier, I do invite you to follow us on our Facebook page and on our website at fcclincoln.org. And join us, if you are able, uh, for in-person worship on Sunday. We do worship at 10.30 a.m. Of course, requiring that everyone that comes physically distance and wear their mask. But it is also a joyous time if you feel able to do that. But we are glad that you have joined us today. And we pray God's blessing on you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship and power of the Holy Spirit abide with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.